Welcome to the Success Ascent. My name is Pat Mancuso, the creator and host of our show. And today we have a very special guest here. And I didn't know quite how special until I was doing all the due diligence and preparation for our show. And I know we're going to have some fun today. And for those of you that know me, you think I am loud, a little bit obnoxious, and I have no filter. Man, this guy today, he's going to put me to shame. So let me tell you who we've got with us today. His name is Steve D. Sims. Now, he's got a short bio, which I love. I'm going to read it to you. However, I'm going to give you a quote from his website first. It says, if there's no passion, there's no point. How true. Do you know anyone that's worked with Sir Elton John or Elon Musk? Sent people down to see the wreck of the Titanic on the bottom of the seabed or closed museums in Florence for a private dinner party and then had Andrea Bocelli serenade them while they eat their pasta. You do now. It's the gentleman that we're talking to today. He's quoted as the real life Wizard of Oz by Forbes Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine. Steve Sims is a best-selling author of the book Blue Fishing, which we're going to get into today, The Art of Making Things Happen. He's one of the most sought after coaches and speakers around, has taught, is spoken at a variety of network groups and associations, as well as the Pentagon and Harvard twice. That's amazing to get invited back to there. So, Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, I always have fun with my guests when we start, and I say, okay, that was Steve on paper. Tell us something that we didn't hear about the real Steve. Uh, that's easy. I'm boring. Um, I'm boring and I'm curious. Um, and it's funny to have those kind of things during COVID. I went to work on my garden. Um, I was doing a lot of gardening. I was cleaning my motorbike. I like isolation. I ride motorcycles ever since birth for a few reasons. One, I can't give you a lift. I can't pick up the groceries. You can't phone me. I've got complete cocooned isolation for the time I'm on my motorcycle. So I'm actually a boring introvert. But it's that curiosity that has got me into the rooms with Elton John, Guns N' Roses, uh, and some of the richest, most powerful people in the planet. So I, I, it would be real interesting to hang out with you and, and validate that introvert over a, you know, a, a little, uh, let's say, drink, shall we say. <laughs> so you've got a little bit of an accent, Mr. Sims. Where are you from? Oh, you know, funny enough, it's a, it's a bit of a, a bastardized one. I'm from East London. Um, I managed to get a job in Hong Kong where I hung out with a lot of Australians and Americans. Um, then I went down to Bangkok, over to Switzerland, Geneva, over to Palm Beach, and now I reside here up in the hills of California, uh, just outside of Los Angeles. The funny thing is, I phoned someone in London the other day because I've got to go back to England this this year. And the guy on the phone shouted at his mate because he needed him to take the call. Got a guy on the phone from New Zealand. <laughs> so that's, that's how bad my accents got messed up over the years. Oh, and, I, and I've, I've even heard you reference in one of the videos something about Irish. Oh, yeah, my family's Irish. In fact, I was the firstborn of my family on British soil. Okay. So they always take the piss out of me that I'm not truly Irish. I'm British. But oh, they're all uh, they're all Irish. So even my kids, yeah, you know, they got the red head and the and the attitude. So yeah, I'm a, I'm an Irish boy from East London. I love it. I love it. Well, you know, so so Steve, our show is focused on the journey of success, and we know that that journey isn't always upwards. In fact, sometimes it's sideways. Sometimes it's backwards. Sometimes we pivot. We're going to talk about that today. So tell me, let's just go back a little bit in time. You know, before you wrote the book. You, you had this hospitality uh, entity. Tell me about that. Do you know, you set it up and it could have been set up better. Um, I came from, and I'm going to be harsh, a poor family. It wasn't until I was a little bit older that I realized we just didn't have money. <laughs> we were actually very wealthy with love, dedication, loyalty, commitment, politeness, respect. We just didn't have cash. So... I wasn't poor. I was just financially restricted. But as I grew up in like a, you know, a shitty area of London and I didn't go to nice places. In fact, we joke, I had my first takeaway when I was 18 years old because getting a takeaway was too expensive for my family. And that's what other people did. So 
as I grew up, I wanted to surround myself with rich people because I wanted to know how come you're rich and I'm not. You know, as a bricklayer, I was getting up and going on a building site at five o'clock in the morning and I was coming home at eight o'clock at night. So, hey, I was working hard, but I didn't have money. So I went out trying to find rich people. Now, the funny thing is, I found rich people wanted to spend money and tell good stories. So the hospitality business you talk about, you glorified it slightly. I was a doorman of a nightclub, but I knew where all the parties were going on because sometimes they needed me to work on the door. So I started knocking around with rich people, trying to give them access into things they couldn't get in. And the only reason I did that, not because I was a party animal, because I really am not, was because I wanted to get in front of rich people. If I could solve your problem, yes. i.e. make you more interested and get you into a cool party with people, I had your attention. And if I had your attention, I could ask you, hey, Johnny, why are you rich and I'm not? And so my hospitality business, my concierge to the rich and famous uh, and the rich and unknown was quite simply a Trojan horse just to get in the room with you and go, hey, Bill, did you enjoy playing piano with Elton John? Did you enjoy hanging out with Elon Musk and Richard Branson? Great, yeah. brilliant. Now, let me ask you, what makes you so special or why are you rich and so many people are not? And I spent 25 years asking the most powerful people in the planet that question out of my curiosity to help me change what I needed so that I could be on the other end of that question one day. Interesting. So it, very learning based, obviously. And you, you said the word curiosity. And so let me ask you a question around that. What was the most surprising thing you heard in those answers? Because here you are talking to highly successful people. You mm -hmm. know, they, they've done obviously some things right. What was the most surprising thing you heard in asking that question? Oh, dear. Um, should I give you three? Uh, you get listen. I love when guests under promise and over deliver. I love there it. There you go. There, I, then, then I'm here. I'll give you the three things that I think dictate every successful person in the planet. And understand, wealth is a byproduct of success. You don't get wealthy by not doing anything. You have to do the journey first, and that's the successful mindset. There are three things that these people see and do differently to non-successful and non-wealthy people. The first thing is they value and see time differently to others, okay? Right. They look at it and they go, okay, what can I do in this hour? What can I do in this weekend? What can I do in the year of COVID? Because they can make more money, but they can't make more time. Right. So they value time more than non-successful people. How many people do we know during COVID that turned around and went, Hey, Pat, oh, you know, we can't do anything now. What should I watch on Netflix? Four hours was the average time during COVID for people watching Netflix. Four hours a day. And those people are not getting wealthier. No. Okay? no. So the point is there were a lot of people that were like, okay, this has happened. And this was the question. How can I make happen? How can I make COVID happen for me? Not to me. How can I make it happen? For me, how can this be an advantage? How can this be an opportunity? So that was the first thing. They looked at um, hours differently to other people as to how they can create impact in it rather than how long they can sit on their ass. That was the first thing. The second thing I noticed about wealthy people is they value relationships. Yeah. You know, we all joke about it. We've all seen it in the movies. Oh, let's do lunch. Let's grab a, let's grab a drink. Now, we always joked that, oh, you know, rich people, they want to go and play golf with someone for two hours. And I used to, I hate golf. <laughs> and it always used to kind of like, well, let's, let's, go and, let's go and have lunch. Let's go and play golf. Let's go. And I'd be like, why do we want to do that? I want to do this business. Right. Successful people want to do business with people. Okay. And they want to get to know people. They want to get to know the relationship because they can do business with anyone. But they want to know, do you meet the same mindset as me? Right. And do you benefit the culture that me and my company are offering? They want to recruit people that fit, okay? And to have them fit, 
they've got to do the they, they've got to do the donkey work of getting to know the person. So they have lunch with people to get to know them, not to know the resume, to know them. So they value relationships more than what other people do. And the final thing, quite simply, is they fail. Okay? Yeah. And when they fail, they lean into it. So successful people lean into things that go wrong to see where they went wrong, to get the benefit. You see, you don't become successful by success. Right. You become successful when the shit hits the fan and you go, <laughs> where did that go wrong? And then you go, ah, I'll give you, I'll name drop and I'll give you a story. I was, very, I was very honored to be in the um, in the operation room of SpaceX when they were checking those rockets coming out. Do you remember when the reusable fuel cells were coming out of the sky and landing on the floating platform? Yes. yes. And do you remember it would land nearly, 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 it'd fall over and it'd explode? Do you yep. remember seeing that on the news? That, yeah, yeah. Do you remember seeing it on the news a lot of times? Uh, I don't know. There was quite a few. When was the last time you saw it happen? It's been a while. Why is that? Because they learn from it. It bloody works now, yeah. and therefore it's not news. It's yeah. only news when it falls over it and explodes, and they can go, poor Elon, that was another $100 million. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I was there when that came down. As it's coming down, no one's breathing. Silence. Yeah. It gets close. It gets close. It gets close. It just starts to land and then it falls over and explodes. Every engineer in the room, including Elon, did the exact same thing. When it fell over, they leant in to look at the data. They leant into the mistake. They leant into the problem. Where did it go wrong? And it was in them leaning into the problem rather, rather than leaning back, putting their heads on their hands and Throwing a pity party and going, oh shit, I've lost fifty million dollars. Where did it go wrong? Because it came, it went up. Yeah, good, got yeah. that right. It came down, got that right. It nearly landed, got that right. Platform was in the right place, got that right. So where did it not go right? Once I get that bit, I'll be all right. And that's what happened. So successful people lean into the problem for the education. There's no such thing as a failure. It's an education. Yeah, it's okay? a learning opportunity. But so many people are scared of failing. Me, yeah. I want to fail every single day. In fact, hand on heart, if I don't fail in the next few days, few minutes, I haven't tried hard enough. And when you're not failing, you're not trying. When you're not trying, you're standing still. And anything that stands still becomes stagnant, stinks, and dies. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, you know, Steve, here's what I love that you said. You not only teach it, but you live it. Because when I reached out to you, you didn't know me from Adam. And yet I reached out because I follow somebody who helped you uh, as part of writing your book process. And we have a desire to write a book. And you were grateful enough to respond and say, yes, I'd love to be on your show. And so you don't just teach it, you live it. And, that, and that's what I absolutely love. So let me, let me ask you this. So the journey that you've had of success you, 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 we had some conversations before we started and you kind of shared with me some things pre COVID and pre the book. And so what I want to ask you is beyond what you learned in interviewing those, you know, wealthy people, what did you also learn about the journey of success? Um, I learned that the journey of success was the journey of failure. I remember walking into a room once with a very famous uh, business icon and as we walked into the room, there'd been a lot of rooms that we would go in and people would try and get photographs with him or something. We walked into this room and as they were taking our coat, he looked over the room and he turned around to me and he said, oh, great. It's a room for the failures. And in that room was people like Sir Richard Branson. And uh, I think Peter Diamandis was in there. The, the guy behind the X-Praise, Joe Polish was there. There was a lot of really cool people that yeah. I knew. And I'm like... He's just calling them failures. And I was a bit kind of like, that's not fair. And Joe Polish is a dear friend of mine. And I wanted to rebut it. And then he turned around and he said, don't you love it when people try? And then they allow it to refine them, not define them. Yeah. And I realized that being in a room full of failures was a good thing. I don't want to go into a room full of 
experts that have never failed at anything. Yeah. I want to go into a room where, hey, I did this and I lost $2 million. I tried to do this and it failed. I launched this widget. No one bought it. That's Those are the people that have the education that are going to help me. And yeah. when he went in there, I realized that it's the failure that does refine us. It doesn't define us. Right. You're not defined by your, your mistakes. You're refined by the actions you can do from them. And that's what I was uh, very happy about. I love that. I love that. So you said something to me in the beginning, and, and I think sometimes entrepreneurs and you know solopreneurs and business owners, they struggle with this. And that's what, what are they doing and why are they doing it? And you shared how you started and then the transition you made in, in your journey when you started focusing, you, you thought the focus was of money. Talk about that a little bit. So, you know, we focus on what we don't have. Um, and what we really need to focus on is we don't know what we don't know. And right. so when I was looking around there and I was going, hang on a minute, that person's over there in a, in a fancy car and that person's over there with brilliant pictures, you know, on their Instagram page showing me how inadequate my life is. You don't know that all that shit's rented. You don't know right. that you could borrow anything. Um, and I was looking at the wrong thing. In fact, the focus was I was looking. I wasn't feeling. I wasn't reacting. I wasn't being triggered. I was looking. And today... We look and validate through our eyeballs. And that's why there's all those fake gurus out there. There's all those assholes leaning up against cars they don't own. There's all of that fake experience that you can buy for $9.99 a month when you buy that shitty course. When I went out there, I wanted to get to the bottom. But in the early stages, I was being tricked by my eyeballs. And I was suddenly realizing I want to understand the core. I want to understand the substance. So now, through my experience, I become experienced by wasting money on people that didn't have experience. You know, they'd, sure. they'd seen a seminar, they'd read it in a book, they'd regurgitated it into a 12-step course, and now they were selling it to me for $50, but they knew bugger all about it. Yeah. Now I focus on the credibility and the source of the information. And that's what people have got to do. As I was growing up, I was sometimes talking to people because they had a fancy car. And during the conversation, I would realize that they had bought that car on, on finance right. to show off to everybody else, but they didn't have any substance. Yeah. And they, didn't, they couldn't make money. You know, as, as um, uh, I, forget, I forget the rapper that, uh, that actually said it, but he said that if you can't buy it three times, you can't afford it. And <laughs> I just love that saying. Yeah. <laughs> there, were so, there were so many people out there that yeah. were literally just kind of like reaching out to try and fake it till you make it, uh, right. as they say. So and I wanted to speak to people that had actually made it in the substance. So that was one of my big learning lessons, to actually ask the questions of the person that's giving you the information and to ask them, how have you got that information? Why right. should I listen to you? We have to grill the people that we get information from today. Even if you can't talk to them. Right. Double check them. You know, the internet's a great thing. Search out on them. Find out if they can do it or find out if they're full of shit. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that. The other day I saw on Facebook, there was an ad that popped up for a guru. And it's the first time I've ever seen this happen where, and it obviously told me a lot, where all the comments were, this guy was nothing but a fake. And, you know, the, the product was terrible. And I, and I mean, it wasn't just one person, Steve. It was like 150 people. And I'm thinking if I'm that guy, I, I got to realize that I'm not as who, who I say I am. And that's really what you're talking about is, is the integrity of, of the people that you're following. I mean, it just, it just was really validated there. Well, there you go. COVID. All right. So first of all, understand your audience. They always say, know your room you're in. OK, yes, we've just gone through COVID prior to COVID. We were all hyped up on, you know, cryptocurrency and the world's going great. And we're all making money. And then we went through a year of being restricted, lied to, confused. Uh, everything was loud. We lived in a world of mass distortion and distraction. Right. Which has basically made that made us very pissed off. OK. <laughs> We don't, we are constantly aggravated. We don't want to be sold to, right? You know, we want to be solved. You know, I don't want you giving me this slick sales funnel. I want you going, Hey, Steve, I can solve your problem. 
Because if you can solve my problem, I don't give a shit about anything that you look like, your brand, your website. I want the solution to my problem. It's all about the me. Right. So for, for that point, I want to know that you have the integrity to do it. You have the credibility. You have the know-how. You can solve my problem. Those are the things. So today, we're in a credibility currency. And a lot of the gurus haven't been able to earn any money this year. So that's why they're releasing a course and selling. The amount of online SEO and Facebook advertising specialists I have met because they could push the, push the boost button for 30 bucks, and now they're selling a course on it. Right. It's just a pile of shit out there. I want you to remain pissed off. I want you to remain skeptical and cynical, and I want you to look at the source every single time. If you're trying to sell me a course, why? If you think you could do this to me, what's the proof that you could do it for you? Right. Isn't it amazing that the amount of people that talk about how to be rich are not? Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I literally I went out the other day and I said, Why are you buying courses from people that are talking about billion being a billionaire that have never worked with a billionaire ever? But you're you're buying that course. Why are you doing that? Yeah. Well, I saw the other day somebody commented that you can take and rent a jet for four thousand dollars an hour and take pictures, and of course it's yours, and that's that perception, right? Yeah. So let me shift gears. You you we talked a little bit about this, so I don't want to give a lot of it away, but prior to COVID, you were kind of, you were, you were obviously making a lot of things happen, but you decided to write this book and then the book really changed the trajectory of what is going on in your world. Talk a little bit about that. I didn't want to steal all the thunder, just enough to give you the, the start. So I believe that if you know great people, great things happen. Right. Um, and so the daft thing was I, I had a very successful travel concierge industry. It was very successful. And I was in a bar having a chat with someone, telling stories, and literally they said, you should write a book. And I was like, ah, I don't care. I don't want to write a book. I don't want to be one of these people that writes books. No, 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 I'm not doing it. And then they spoke to me a bit more, and they actually sent me a contract. Now, I was very blasé about it. A friend of mine, um, uh, a friend of mine just down the road, Jay Abraham, I'm very proud to be able to call him as a friend. I spoke to him, and I said, look, I've been offered this deal on a book. And I remember him saying something to me when we walked into his house. He said to me, before we'd even sat down and cracked open the whiskey, he said, are you ready for what this could do to you? And remember, to you, not for to you, you, to yeah. you. And I went... Yeah, I, it's not going to do anything. And he went, be prepared, be prepared. And I remember thinking, that's that's daft. How can write a book do anything to you? Someone's either going to buy it or they're not going to buy it. You now, know? Minor, Steve, you're speaking to Jay Abraham, right? I mean, it's yeah. not like this guy hasn't been around the block, but you're still oh, yeah. telling him. Yeah, I love it. I yeah, love yeah. It. So me and Jay, we've known each other for many years. And uh, I was thinking, please, you know, it's a book. The other thing that was bothering me was there's a lot of people out there that release books to make money. Right. Now, when you're selling a book to make money, you dilute and you, you alter the way that you're doing the book because now your single goal focus is to make revenue from it. Right. So if you've got a point of view, you may dilute it slightly to get a wider catch net to attract more people to buy your book. I already had a successful business and through Jay, my retainer, oh my God, it's basically illegal. I defy anyone to get the retainer I got for my book. Unless you're Michelle Obama, my retainer was basically criminal. Um, <laughs> and so get, getting this amount of money meant that I didn't care. I could write the book I wanted to write. If it sold two copies, pfft, gives a shit. I've already been paid. Right. Now, when you've got that kind of attitude, you can be a lot more focused on a book. So... I started working with Megan, uh, who was my, uh, they didn't call her a ghostwriter, they called her a translator, but she helped me put the book together uh, by basically, you know, translating everything I was saying onto paper. Sure. And I suddenly started realizing that what I was doing, a lot of people was not. Not because it was complicated, not because it was hard. Right. But people today overcomplicate shit. And yeah. we wrote this book. And... I thought, my God, no one's going to buy it because it's just, 
It's just telling you the simple, stupid ways to be able to brand, market, reach the clients you want, how to build up relationships, the value of relationships. All of these things is so simple, stupid stuff that you should be doing it already, but you don't. So we, we did the book. We released the book three years ago, and we didn't even have a website. Okay? I was so hell-bent that, hey, I'm not going to be one of these guys. Yeah, I don't care. I'm going to release the book. Great. If my mom you already got your money. You already got your yeah. money. You wrote what you wanted. I'm good. So we didn't. We didn't actually have a website. And I remember when the book came out. After about the first month, I think we'd sold like 400 copies. <laughs> now, bear in mind, this book came out through Simon and Schuster. Again, <laughs> if you know, if you know great people, great things happen. Yes. So I, I wasn't getting some shitty little publishing house right. on the the back end of you know wherever Wisconsin or saying. I apologize, Wisconsin. But, you know, I had Simon Schuster doing my book. 400 copies, okay? And they said to me, uh, Mr. Sims, you're doing no marketing. You don't even have a website on the book. And I was like, ah, and they went, it's in your contract. Oh, You've got to do it. Now, luckily, I had, um, I had done a launch party because they had told me, you have to do a launch party. And they sent me, and this was ridiculous, they sent me $2,000. Now, I'm going to tell everyone where they can see this. SteveDSims.com, look for the book launch video. I watched it. Yeah, it's amazing. So what happened? Well, now, now that I tell you the story, it'll make sense to you. So they sent me $2,000, and they said, look, we've checked it out. There's a Barnes & Noble at the uh, local um, Los Angeles area called The Grove. We want you to get a table buy champagne, and sit there on a Saturday afternoon and sign copies. And I thought to myself, no one's going to look at me and walk over there with that little girl going, hello, I wonder what that angry man's writing a book about. Let's go. And no one's going to talk to me. And they sent me $2,000. So I said to them, I said, so I can spend this money on the book launch however I wish. And they went, absolutely. So I went down to my local whiskey bar, signed over the money to them, the check, because they sent me a check, which was weird. And I said, um, I'm going to invite a bunch of my mates. We're going to drink whiskey. When the check runs out, turn the lights on and kick us out. <laughs> and they went, yeah, all right. So I phoned up a bunch of my friends, and Jay couldn't make it. But we had Jim Quick, Lewis Howes, Greg Reed, Kayla Maddox, Cole Howe. We had a whole bunch of people turn up at this thing. And there was a girl there, uh, Sonia Hatter, who recorded it. Oh, and wow. then she made... And I wasn't aware of this. I had no idea. And the video proves it because you've seen it. So yes. my next statement, you're going to be able to clarify this. I had no idea she was doing this. So literally, at the beginning of the night, everyone's sober. And everyone's <laughs> like, oh, Steve, it's such a miracle. He's a, great guy. He's, a, he's a wonderful fella. Stand up, handsome little bugger he is. And so it's all this kind of niceties. Yes. And then as the video goes on through the night, Everyone's getting shit faced, and it's they are starting to swear at each other. And, and so she sent me this video. She says it's really funny, but this is your video of your book night. So when Simon and Schuster moaned at me and said, You haven't got a website, I went, All right. So we stuck up one page, and it was like, This is how I did a book launch for Bluefish in the Art of Making Things Happen. Buy it here at Amazon. And I put that video up there. Oh it's one page shitty little website from Fiverr and on two months it sold 400 copies each month third month because of that video being real 8,000 copies That's and crazy then it just took off and all of a sudden I was getting contacted by Simon Schuster going hey you got to sign off on this because you know uh, China want to release it in Mandarin Chinese uh, Thailand uh, publishing house wants to release it in Thai Vietnamese uh, want to release it. Um, it went out in Poland. It sold out all printed copies in Poland in two hours. Oh um, it's actually been released earlier this year in Russian. So <laughs> it's in like it's it's literally all over the planet. Wow! And the trouble is, people are now contacting me, and that's where you don't realize. And that's what Jay was saying. People are contacting me. I've got speaking gigs all over the planet. Um, yeah. I'm back in Thailand again next year, uh, training and teaching in Thailand. I'm, I'm for everywhere from Indianapolis, Indianapolis to Florence this year. So it, my world got taken over 
by teaching, training, and coaching people on how to build up billionaire relationships. Wow. Well, it just goes back to tell me how grateful you are that you took the time to be with us today, number one. Number two, you know, what I took away from that, and we talked a little bit about that in the beginning, is things don't happen to you, they happen for you. And, you you know, in the beginning, we sometimes don't see that. Yep. So, so Steve, just a little bit before we shift gears, um, if somebody were, wanted, were to want to know about the book, what would they take away from the book? Like, give me a two-minute synopsis. It will aggravate them um, because I I don't overcomplicate. The bottom line of it is I go for maximum impact, and a hammer has maximum impact, <laughs> and it certainly ain't pretty. So the bottom line of it is you're going to read a book that is based on a, a kid kicked out of school at the age of 15 that pretty much was a bricklayer that now can, can quote Elon Musk, the Pope, Sir Richard Branson, and Sir Elton John. It's going to aggravate you because this is all stuff that you can do. It's all stuff that I've done right. and that you can do. So there's no one in the planet that can't do what I've done. So it will piss you off. It will aggravate you. And you will sit there and go, why am I not doing that? It's because somewhere down the line you were told, no, 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 no one does that. So you should be doing it. So it's going to make you more impactful. It's right. probably going to save you a lot of money. Because you should start forgetting about the click funnel. Ca Sorry, Russell, but forget yeah. about the funnel campaigns and stuff. Focus on the impact. Focus on the solution. All yeah. of that other stuff is great icing, right. great distribution, but focus on the uh, on the front door first. Well, and it always goes back to relationships, right? I mean, yep. some of the names you've mentioned. You know, I followed Joe Polish for a long time. And, and, you know, he's amassed amazing relationships with people. And, and uh, you know, there's just a lot of there's a lot of commonality there and a lot of names that you've mentioned. And so so now I'm in that group because you and I have met. I love that. I love that. So let's shift gears a little bit, Mr. Sims. I prepared you for this. Tell me the absolute best advice you've ever been given that hopefully you followed. A friend of mine, Ari Mizell, put it best. He said, get going, then get good. Too many people try to do something perfect the first time. And I hate to break it to you, but as entrepreneurs, the first time you do anything, it'll be shit yeah. uh, compared to what it'll be down the line. So best piece of advice was get going, then get good. I love that. I love that. So we always flip it upside down and we say, okay, what's the absolute worst advice that you've ever been given that hopefully you didn't follow? And if you did follow that bad advice, what did you learn? And it always happens in the pub. There's always some prick in the pub that turns around and says, you couldn't do that. Don't try that, Steve. You'll waste all your energy. Now, the danger would be to listen to that person. The, the fuel would be to use that to prove them wrong. But it's amazing how many people that are around your life, whether they're in a coffee shop or in a pub, that are telling you you can't do it for fear that you will actually do it and prove how inadequate that they are. You know, isn't that, it, it is interesting, right? That others try to limit, uh, people try to limit others because that's kind of how they feel about themselves and they yep. want to hang out with similar people, right? Yep. So I'm going to get you ready. I'm going to do a little housekeeping here. I want, I'd love to have your final thoughts. So first of all, ladies and gentlemen, those of you that are watching live and those of you that will listen to the podcast later on, we so appreciate your support, your listening. Go to www.thesuccessascent.com. You can sign up for our updates. You can also find out where to find us. We're all over the major channels and uh, subscribe there. Uh, also, I'm going to drop uh, Steve's website in here in just a second as he uh, is going to give us his final thought. Um, we always love to, to have you love all over our guests and follow them uh, because they give their time and we so appreciate that. So Steve, give us your final thought. Like what would be the, and, and by the way, let me just say this, you have been amazing today. And I know that when I read the book, I'm probably going to get angry because of just how simple you're making it sound. And yet I love the analogy of the hammer because I think we all need the hammer sometimes. I, I just love that. Yeah. So what would you leave us with your final thought? My dad is, uh, you know, using the analogy of a hammer. He ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, and he's a bricklayer. And I remember many, many years ago, I was probably only about 13 or 14 years old, and we're walking down the road. And he wasn't even looking at me, but he just put his hand on my shoulder as we were walking. And he went, son, remember, no one ever drowned by falling in the water. 
they drown by staying there. <laughs> and he takes his hand off my shoulder and carries on walking. Now, I remember at the age of 13 or 14 going, what the fuck was that? You know, <laughs> well, what did that come for? I was completely confused. Um, but as the years have gone on and as entrepreneurs, we fall over a lot. You yeah. know, we fall in the water a lot. But it's our choice whether or not we climb out of it or we just want to kind of like sink and cry. So that's been a real guiding guiding light to me. Yeah. Well, that, and, and what great advice, right? What great advice. So, Steve, again, I want to just thank you so much uh, for your time today. Um, I, I know that uh, when I get the book and read it, it's going to be awesome. And then uh, I'll, I'll have that analogy of the hammer. I just I even got that picture in my head of the hammer. And uh, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. And as I end every show, be safe, be healthy, and be happy. Bye-bye. Thanks, Steve.